How's it going YouTube? Joe Totino here back with another trailer music tutorial. It's again been a long time since I've done one of these, um, but I wanted to switch it up and do something a little different. So in the spirit of Halloween coming up, uh, I figured it might be fun to take a listen to a horror trailer track and talk about my approach to writing this style of music uh, and some of the sample libraries and plugins that I use when I'm breaking away from the epic orchestral stuff uh, and getting into something that's a little more minimal and tense, suspenseful music design for horror. So this track is um, gonna be released on a five track EP I have coming out with uh, one of the publishing companies I write for. So it's an unreleased track. Uh, I just finished it this morning. So we'll go ahead and take a listen and break down the Logic session and talk about some of my approaches to writing horror music for trailers. See you over in Logic. All right, here we are in my Logic session. So as I mentioned, uh, this is a unreleased track that I just finished earlier today. So please excuse the lack of organization. Uh, I'm generally not the person to stop my creative process to organize and color code tracks, but eventually I'll go through and clean this up before I stem it out and send it off to the publisher. Um, you see by looking at the session, it's not insanely complicated. There's only 35 tracks, maybe 40 in total uh, with, with buses and effects and things that I only have set up in my mixer. Um, but with this style of music, I find that the instrumentation tends to be a little simpler. Um, we're relying on signature sounds and some sort of unique sonic identity for these tracks. Uh, and the cues usually end up being a lot shorter as well. This track clocks in at just about a minute 30. Um, and I find with these, these types of trailer tracks, I can sometimes get away with a minute 10, 60, 80, 90 second tracks. So we're not talking about that two, two and a half, three minute trailer cue that we're used to when we're writing big orchestra stuff. So um, I think as long as you're creating that idea of suspense and build, and you've got those unique sonic signatures that you can use to carry the track out, um, a shorter track seems to work really well for the horror suspense genre. So let's first go ahead and take a listen to the entire cue, and then we'll start breaking down uh, what I use to build it. Cool, so that was um, my unnamed track that'll be out on uh, a new horror EP I have coming out very soon. So when it comes to writing this style of music, uh, again, unlike the orchestral tracks I've done walkthroughs of in the past, I'm not usually sitting down at the piano and coming up with a melody or a chord progression. Uh, a lot of times these types of tracks are very um, simple in terms of harmony. There's not a lot of harmony movement in here. It, it really kind of sits on the same note. Um, and I'm more so using, again, unique sound effects to kind of drive along the track. So this is a good combination of my own signature sounds that I've designed and a couple of sounds from libraries that I'm relying on. So uh, I think I did kind of start it out as what a normal traditional trailer cue would start with a big piano ping. Uh, this is coming to us from 
Let's open up contact. Uh, I guess it's also worth mentioning too, uh, I don't normally start with a template like I would um, on a, uh, a, a big orchestra track where I've got my trailer template that I have set up in Logic. If I go new from template and open up that Logic template folder, uh, in my template folder, I have my trailer templates here. With this type of production, I like to start with a blank session because I really like to explore some of the libraries that I maybe don't use as often. Uh, I like to open up some of the synths that I don't always gravitate towards. I like to kind of force myself to do my own source recordings, and I find with a blank session, I'm a little more prone to doing that. So here's my piano ping. Uh, I paired that with a sub boom, which I think is coming to us from uh, Mammoth's Density. And just in your kind of traditional trailer fashion, we've got a really low sub, a really high piano ping, and that contrast works really well to grab people's attention. And pairing that with a pad from Omnisphere. Kind of a low growly pad. Looks like on the pad, I'm just cutting out, yeah, just some of the low rumbly frequencies make room for some of that sub energy and doing a little bit of multiband compression on as well. So not only cutting out the sub, but also doing some, some dynamic control when, that, when those sub frequencies that are poking through uh, get over a certain threshold. I can, I can use the, the multiband to pull them down. And I think that's it for the first few seconds here. Uh, the next sound that's introduced is this pluck. And I've got throughout this track uh, kind of driving along. Um, it starts kind of right here on bar six. And then here at bar 11, it kind of becomes a little bit more static. I have this driving cello pattern. So I do have some stringed instruments, violins and whatnot that I will pick up and record for this type of production. Uh, I don't have a cello. And so a lot of times when I'm looking for a really intimate, organic sounding dry cello, I'll grab uh, Mammoth's Audio Density because they just sound so fantastic. And I layered those with a pizzicato pluck. So you've got the pizzicato, kind of a Bartok snap, and the standard, uh, maybe that's the, the staccato for Mammoth, and pairing those two together. You've got this kind of really full, the pizzicato is giving us a little bit, a little bit more of the attack, and the density... Um, spiccato hit is giving us a lot of the body. So that's what I have coming in here just to kind of signify that something different's happening. Uh, I think that's a good tip for any of this style of music is every few bars introducing a new idea, taking an element out, really trying to give the editor a lot of different toys to play with. Um, so those three, four elements in the beginning sound like this. I introduce a big whoosh hit here. And then a bunch of risers that are taking us to silence right at the at bar 10. Uh, and this is my first edit point right here. So another tip for doing horror and suspense is giving the editor lots of edit points. You know, I've watched a lot of horror trailers, and one of the things I've picked up is the unpredictability of how they're edited. Um, not to say that any type of trailer has a predictability to it, but I think especially in horror, when you're watching these trailers, they're trying to keep you on your toes. And the easiest way to make your tracks more licensable is to make it more editable, make it easier for someone to be able to chop the heck out of this thing and rearrange and restructure it to picture. Uh, and so there are a, a lot of edit points in here, moments where I'm essentially either pulling out instruments or adding a single instrument or doing something to try and make the editor's life a little bit easier. Um, so these risers here, uh, they come from all over. Some of these are my risers that I made. Uh, I think this riser here is actually the piano ping in reverse. So that's a really cool trick I like to use uh, is taking a piano ping like this. I'll even uh, duplicate this just to show you how I do it. Pulling down some MIDI, all we need for this is one note and tossing on some sort of really big spacious reverb. So for this type of stuff, I really like using Native Instruments ROM. So all we do is have this 
this really long lustrous reverb. I'm not sending it to a reverb. I'm inserting that reverb right on here because what I'm actually going to do now is bounce that track in place, making sure that I've got the big reverb tail in that file. And now I can come into Logic's file browser and reverse that. And I have a really satisfying pluck. And so that's exactly what I did for that piano riser that's in the track here, is just duplicated that track, turned it into an audio file. I'll normally get rid of that duplicate MIDI track when I'm done, just to save myself a little bit of processing and um, clean up my session of hair. So I've got that riser, and then I have a couple of other risers here. This is a, a, a string riser. I have a guitar suck back, which I know looks like it's doesn't look like a riser, uh, but this is some weird bug with Logic um, that I'm sure will get fixed at some point. But if I click in and actually look at the file browser here, you can see it, it truly does rise. I don't know why it's displaying this way. But I think what I did for this is took a guitar from uh, Contact and did basically the same thing that I did with this piano. So kind of created this rising tension, and then I have a traditional horror riser, probably from um, Keep Forest. And another riser down here uh, that I actually made. So one of the things I've been doing a lot of, especially for this album, is sampling my water phone. So I have a water phone that stays in my studio here, and I've been doing lots of weird sound effects with it, and then taking those and reprocessing them in different ways. So I wanted to just add um, A, my own layer in here, my own element that's not in a library that wasn't a contact sample, that was something that I added, but it also adds a really nice high frequency tinge that some of the other risers didn't have. Uh, I am using um, what has very quickly become a secret weapon for me, maybe a not so secret secret weapon since uh, a lot of uh, my engineering friends and, produ and music producer friends are, are, are crazing about this Soothe 2. Uh, it's essentially a resonant suppressor tool. So I found that, especially when I'm doing lots of processing on these water phones, especially as we build up to these louder parts, some of those resonances were just a little painful in the ears. And what this tool does is it kind of intelligently brings down some of those resonances. You can see it work. Where it's analyzing my audio and trying to figure out, hey, what might hurt your ears? And let's reduce the amplitude of that uh, just to make something a little bit easier, more soothing to listen to. So altogether, those risers sound like this. which worked really well uh, when layered together. And then I am hard cutting a lot of the other tracks off where these risers, they're not being sent to a reverb. So the file just kind of ends and I'm doing a, a really short fade on each one of these just so I'm not getting a pop or a click. But for other things that may normally have like a decay tail like this Omnisphere pad, uh, I'm using automation in uh, Logic just to mute that right at bar 10 so I have an absolute bar of silence. A little less than a bar because this whoosh hit comes in right before bar 11, but th there's a, a distinct edit point here. So let's take one more listen to the beginning. Here comes that pluck. And right there is an easy place for an editor to just snip that intro out if they want to reuse it or, or add that into a different part in the trailer spot. So moving on to my act two. Uh, another big tip with this type of trailer production is we're sticking to the three acts. Um, you can kind of see how I've broken down the track where this is my act one. This is my act two, and then this is my act three and outro. So I'm sticking to that three act structure and, and trying to create, again, a sense of build like I would in an orchestral track where each act is a repeated idea, but building upon the last. So my act two 
starts out with the same whoosh hit, the same string plucks, but now I'm introducing some new ideas. Doesn't get more cliche in trailers than clocks. Now, I wasn't finding a clock loop that did exactly what I wanted it to do. Uh, so I actually found this sound. I think I found it in uh, one of my sound effect libraries. So um, I do a lot of work uh, for independent films. So I have a large collection of, of just general sound effects, all sorts of stuff. And so I, I think I found this in one of my sound effect uh, banks and just kind of cut it up uh, and turned it into the clock pattern that I wanted. And then just to add a little bit of interest, I found these little reverse sounds, which are just little like, glitchy sounds, which I thought sounded really cool with the clock, so. It just creates a little bit more uncertainty. It just makes the track feel a little bit more tense. Um, people have overdone this clock, and, and I'm obviously playing into the cliche a bit here, but it, it worked. But I wanted to do something a little different just to, to make that stand out. Uh, and then I'm introducing another signature sound here, um, my synth bass. Which, this is from Arturius Pigments, which is an absolutely fantastic synth. Uh, I've been loving this for doing sound design. I've been loving it for making my own um, drones and atmospheres. This is a preset that I tweaked. I think I played around with the ADSR uh, a bit to get the tone a little more what I wanted. And then I'm doing uh, a lot of processing on here just to shape it a little further. So the same company who makes that um, Soothe plugin also, also makes a tool called Spiff. And Spiff works similarly to Soothe, but it's for uh, transient information. So you've got a cut and a boost, um, similar to like Native Instruments, which I'm also using here, their Transient Master, but this works on a frequency basis. So I'm actually cutting out some of the attack so if I actually take all my plugins off, I just wanted to get rid of that, that click at the beginning. I wanted to make it a little softer and I couldn't get the result I wanted out of the synth. Uh, boosting the attack, I was losing some of the harmonics at the beginning. So I decided to leave the synth as is and see if I could get a similar result by processing this uniquely. So Spiff is doing this. So it's getting rid of a lot of those high frequencies. We can actually solo what the plugin is getting rid of by hitting this delta down here. And you can hear it's primarily this like snap. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. I'm running it through um, Fab Filter just to get rid of some muddiness and some of the high frequencies. A Little bit of OTT just to um, give it a nice gentle hug. And then the transient shaper from Native Instruments to, again, bring down more of the attack and just a hair boosting that sustain. And I get this kind of low, girthy, fat bass that I'm sending off to um, ROM, which is kind of my uh, big reverb of choice these days. I love the way this sounds. It tends to be a little airy, so I, I, I'm always cutting out some of these high frequencies, and I'm even doing some additional EQing on ROM just to get rid of any muddiness and super shrilly high frequencies that I want other instruments to be able to live in. So these are pretty much my two new sounds. Which set up kind of a nice rhythm for me, uh, pairing that with the sub booms and the hits. That was my foundation, and then I layered on top uh, those strings. So I started that string pluck here. Now I'm progressing it a little faster. Another clock. This one I was able to find a loop. So this is a loop that was at 120 BPM that I just time stretched to match my tempo at 115. And then everything else that's down here in this section are all my own samples and recordings. Uh, so again, a lot of these um, horror tracks, I'm trying to add in as much unique flavor as I can. Uh, and a lot of this EP kind of centered around my voice. So making weird effects with my voice, lots of breaths, whistles turned into pads. So just trying to do as much with the voice as I could. Uh, and so I am introducing some breaths. 
which I recorded. This is the microphone I use to record all the vocal samples for this, uh, this EP. So this is my Audio-Technica 4050. Uh, I'll connect this to a warm audio uh, 1073 preamp uh, that I really love. It's an, a Neve emulation and then right into my Apollo. So super easy signal chain, but sounds really fantastic. So I'll generally RX my uh, recordings after I'm done with them. So I have it set up in Logic so I can send anything to RX using a quick key. So you can see I've cut out most of the room sound between the breaths. And I'm really doing that so an editor can use this track in solo in isolation if they want to. I don't want an editor, an editor to want my breaths and to also then hear the sound of my room and horns honking outside and all of that stuff. I live in New York City. It's really tough to find a time where it's quiet enough to record, but RX comes in and usually saves the day uh, so I can clean up a lot of that noise outside of my recording. So this has already been cleaned. Uh, and then I used Logic's Flex just to make sure that I was locked into the grid here. I've got some more water phone samples here. So again, these were all samples I recorded and then reprocessed, some string effects and a, another synth effect. So just trying to kind of sprinkle in some of these um, weird effects to make this otherwise static rhythm feel a little more unique. So we'll take a listen. There's another breath melody, so. That's just me. Just creating kind of a pattern with my breath, something that I felt like was a little creepy, but also kind of rhythmic. Um, on both of these breath processing uh, chains, I'm, I'm using Soothe. So I'm using Soothe to kind of clean up some of, the, again, the harshness and the resonance. Uh, Fab Filter to clean out some of that low end and then the Slate Virtual Mix Rack um, just to hit it with a compressor. For simple vocals like this, I love VCA compressors. They're usually pretty clean. They've got an adjustable attack and release, so you can't go wrong with a VCA style compressor. Something like this, something like an SSL channel, um, I wanted to keep it really simple because no one is hearing the sound of the compressor on here. I just know I wanted to control the dynamics a little bit more. Uh, so together, these two, They kind of play off each other. Introducing some percussion here as well, and then I'm also introducing another breath sample. So for this one, I exhausted myself. Uh, I wanted to create this kind of buildup uh, of me taking breaths of air, almost like I was out of breath, running away from something that was chasing me. Um, and you can see there's a ton of processing on this to get it ultimately the way I wanted it to sound. So this is what the sample sounds like. So kind of just like this, out of breath sound that I'm doing a ton of processing on to make it sound um, kind of distorted and in the background. And you can hear there's a filter uh, and you can even see there's a filter opening up because I'm kind of using this as a rising element along with my sound effects to take us to the second edit point in here. Um, so processing on this one, uh, I'm doing again, fab filter to cut out some low end, soothe and spiff just to get some tone shaping. Uh, the Fab Filter compressor just to slam this a bit. I'm doing quite a bit of compression on here. Um, and then sample delay. And this is one of the tricks I use all the time um, is I like to record in mono. It's simple, it's easy. I've got stereo mics, but a lot of times just to get up an idea down super quick, I'll throw a mic up and 
recorded in mono. But if I want it kind of wide stereo, I can delay one of the channels and it creates the illusion of this stereo image. So kind of like the idea of a Haas effect, um, the idea that sound hits one eardrum just before the other, uh, and it kind of creates this illusion of, of width. I'm being a little aggressive with this, but it sounded cool, so I left it as is. Uh, I'm then doing some clip distortion, which is Logic's own plugin, and I think this is actually what's automating. So if you look at uh, the filter here, I'm starting this pretty closed, and then I'm opening up this filter inside of this distortion. So by the time it gets to the end, so as opposed to using a separate filter plugin, I'm just using the, the, the low pass filter that's in uh, this clip distortion plugin, which is also adding a little bit of grit. You can see I'm doing quite a bit of drive. And then just a hair of OTT to slam it over the top a little and, and add some extra air so it cuts through the mix. So my three breath tracks. And those are all time aligned. More string effects down here. So lots of um, bounced samples that I used uh, some processing on uh, just to, sh again, shape them. With risers, I like working with audio. Um, I find it a lot easier. And I think actually some of these risers came from some orchestral libraries. So um, Metropolis Arc 1, and I think even Metropolis Arc 2, there's some really great string glissandi risers in there. So a lot of times I will record those out, bounce them to audio, and then just structure them to work in the track, which I believe is what this riser is here. And you can hear I'm also automating uh, the send to that reverb just so that we get a little bit of an artificial tail after the riser is done. Uh, some other more sound effecty risers. These are some transition effects from Damage. I love using these because they are um, tempo mapped, so they're both four beat, one bar risers that you can just kind of sprinkle in. They work really good for transitions. Uh, and then I'm also adding in some of my actual percussion in here just to accent downbeats. I didn't want to create too much of a rhythm yet because I want to save the percussion for that last act. Uh, but I'm layering uh, a couple of different percussion libraries. We've got uh, Severus, Damage, and then some trailer hits that I made and, and put into a battery patch. Big sound. On my percussion bus, uh, I don't have any processing. Uh, the drums sounded really good, so I didn't feel like I needed to do as much processing on them. Um, I wanted to kind of leave these a little bit more organic. They're pretty dry and punchy and slammy. I've got another layer that I'm adding in here uh, at the, the during the climax, which has a little bit more of a resonance. You can kind of hear the metal a little bit more, but ultimately I think the drums sounded great and I, I didn't need to do a ton of processing on them. So taking us uh, through act two, let's take a listen. There's some more water phone samples in there. So this couple bars here um, is really just, again, something for an editor to be able to grab onto and, and make cuts at. I wanted to create this kind of tension build up, and then like what most tra uh, horror movies do is they'll usually drop everything out before the big jump scare. So this was kind of my dropout, uh, building tension, giving the audience a chance to breathe, and then reintroducing some of these heavier ideas here in the climax. So really just repeating some of the ideas from Act Two, but stripping down the production a lot. 
uh, drums take us into Act 3, so let's take a listen. Cool. So kind of starting out pretty minimal and then building to a, a big climactic sound. So I'm really not introducing a ton of new ideas. I'm layering up some of the percussion, uh, introducing some new risers, but all of these same ideas from Act 2 are copied into Act 3. I'm just intensifying the rhythms of everything. So drums have this big energetic sound. And you can hear not every drum is playing every note. Uh, I'm using some drums to accent certain hits and other drums to kind of carry along the rhythm. Same idea with the strings here. So we've got these two string patches. Play that with a clock. And then it'll repeat, but faster. Cool. So just trying to build some of the intensity up um, all the same note. So again, I'm not doing it with the harmony. I'm doing it with the, the syncopation, the rhythm. Uh, again, here's my synth bass. Some hits. Kind of accenting that downbeat. For my breaths, I've got um, these two tracks here. These top two are just copies of the sample that I copied over. And then I've got a new track here that I recorded of the deep breaths. So that sounds like this. Again, doing some automation. And that clip distortion is adding such an incredible amount of dirt and grime to the end there. So when that filter opens up, it sounds kind of otherworldly. Uh, I did this all in one take. So um, I, I was seeing stars after uh, for eight bars. I was <sighs> breathing heavy into a microphone, but it was worth it because now I've got, uh, I've got a little bit of my voice in there. Um, and then all the same, some string risers. Again, I think some of these are from Ascendance. Some of these are from Metropolis Arc. I've got an eight bar gravity riser as well. I think I'm using the organic patches um, from uh, gravity with Heavy Aussie's gravity, which is fantastic. And layering those with some of the suck back sounds that we used in the intro in act two. So. All together, it's a pretty big sound. And then ending this off with a little stinger just to give the editor again another little nugget there if they want to pile that onto a, a title card maybe even cut that out use it in an intro uh, again just trying to build in as many of these edit points as i can cool so hopefully you guys enjoyed that hopefully you got something out of it uh as always uh subscribe to the channel and leave a comment if you have any questions any requests Please get in touch if you are interested in learning more about making this type of music, uh, and I hope to be able to do plenty more of these tutorials in the near future. Have a safe and happy Halloween, and I will see you in the next video.